The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Let's talk about Coming to America 2, this time with more blood. That's right, it's Vampire in Brooklyn. What the fuck? Um. Hey everyone, this is Michael T. Bradley. And Audrey Ivancy. And we are talking about the Eddie Murphy vehicle, Vampire in Brooklyn, directed by Wes Craven. The plot of the movie is exactly the same as Coming to America, except now he's a vampire instead of a prince. He's the last of the vampire kind, and he's coming to Brooklyn to find the only chick he can bang and make little vampire babies and restart the race. Yeah, the offspring of the same, like, bloodline or something like that? Some goddamn thing, yeah. Trying to find a hot lady. Right. And even though that's the only way they can reproduce, then at the end, the ring allows someone else to become a vampire, apparently, and that... What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> we need Angie. Angie, step in there. What the fuck? Um. Let's go ahead and run through our what the fuck moments. Audrey, why don't you start us out there? Okay, Maximilian's red ring makes you a vampire, apparently. I, it, it, I'm not even going to try to explain it because it doesn't make any sense. A dog explodes upwards. A slutty roommate that takes your things and flirts with your dude in front of you. Right, that's not cool. Eddie Murphy uses, quote, every spell in his ability to redecorate an apartment. So every spell that, that this vampire line in, in this universe has is used for interior decoration. Preacher convinces his congregation to believe that evil and ass are good. That evil ass is very good. Woo! <laughs> Again, a quote. Talking about that evil preacher... I, I think that's a good place to start with. Let's talk about the... I wanted to say let's talk about the characters, but since Eddie Murphy is multiple characters in this film, let's talk about the actors. First of all, let, let's... Uh, yeah, let's start with Eddie Murphy. What the hell? Eddie Murphy plays three parts in this movie, one of which is that preacher, it, I, and it is actually... And both of the times that Eddie Murphy plays a different character, it is Eddie Murphy's main character, Maximilian, pretending to be the other characters through vampire magic, which... So I'm assuming, since he said I used every spell at my disposal to redecorate, he turned himself into a really good interior decorator as step one, because that was a spell that we know he has, right? Yeah, but it seems that he has to also kill the person that he's impersonating. Yeah, or at least drink their blood. Okay. At least drink enough of it, right? Because yeah. we, we never really see either of those characters dead. We just know that he eats well, from them. Well, you know, he pulls the priest into the... I guess that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. Pulls, yeah. I'm assuming they die, but who knows? So yeah, Eddie Murphy plays three parts, mm -hmm. and two of them are wacky comedic. Yes. The... Uh, He's on a spy mission, so he impersonates that guy that's outside who's trying to rob everybody. He goes in, robs all the, mo the monsters, gets all their weaponry, and then is finally hauled off by the lady cop. Woo woo! From Angela Bassett. Angela Bassett, who finally drags him in, where he is basically trying to figure out anything about her and sabotage her relationship with Justice, her Je partner. Detective Det Justice. Detective Justice. That's right. Detective Justice. Detective Justice is on the case. Mm -hmm. Detective Justice gets horrible theme music whenever he talks to Angela Bassett, mm -hmm. like, as a person. Boo, boo, boo. That's something we got to talk about in music. But no, first, I think, I think the character is a good starting point, okay? Because I want to ask, what movie were they trying to make here? I mean, it's obviously... Uh, I, I think um, I know this one, Michael. <laughs> um, I think it's Vampire in Brooklyn. I don't know if that's the case. They obviously, so essentially if you were pitching this movie, what, it would be like, we're going to remake Dracula, except with, you know, uh, an all-black cast and do a Coming to America-style comedy where Eddie Murphy plays a bunch of different parts and every black person is a stereotype, except for, like, one main character, basically. I think the problem is that they got Wes Craven, who is a really good horror director, not a good comedy director... So, I, to me, I'm segueing into larger issues that I want to talk about here. Yeah, so please, maybe let's, I, I enjoyed the film. So let's just go <laughs> with that. The thing to me is that it's one thing if Eddie Murphy makes a film like Coming to America, and you have all of these wacky black stereotypes, you know, and that's kind of its own, you know, it's like Friday or something. It's its own little genre there. Well, it's his own TM at this point. But... When Wes Craven's directing it, I for I, I don't know if this is crazy of me, but then it feels racist. <laughs> it feels like this movie is just... He didn't just, necessarily cast everybody. 
No, but I mean, can you imagine being Wes Craven, a white guy, and being like, okay, now go do that thing you did again where you say, I trying to be there, motherfucker, you know? And you mean it, him like, being bossy? Right. Trying well, to I, take ownership over this cast? <laughs> 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 just like, I just find that such a strange idea and such a, you know, it's, it's like uh, uh, a friend of mine uh, who felt like, uh, what the hell is that movie? Django Unchained was perhaps, it could have been a good movie, but it was not Quentin Tarantino's story to tell. You know what I mean? Because it's like, he's a little too white to really be telling that story. And it's, it's debatable, obviously. And uh, out of the three story writers and three screenplay writers, I'm guessing the majority of them uh, were people of color, but I, God only knows, because there were a lot of names on there and I didn't recognize any of them. Mm -hmm. But still, it felt weird to me. And again, the comedy bits just really fell flat. It felt as if Wes was just like, well, I don't want to tell them to stop, so we'll just keep rolling. And well, I like the ghoul. The ghoul is cool. Right, Kadeem Hardison. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, he's talented. He's, he's funny. He's a, he's a great actor. I mean, all the, all the actors in here were good. I think Angela Bassett was maybe badly cast. <laughs> Why do you say that? Because of all of her flailing and, and like, she just seems to, it's like, okay, Angela, I want you to show, like, horror at the prospect of you're now this evil beast and, like, her way to do it is just becoming shouty. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't want this! Okay, uh, that's, that's good, Angela. She's having her moral dilemma as she's a lady cop. Yeah, though that's that's the other big that's the other big uh, thing that I want to talk about, but we'll get to that in a minute. So I felt very confused as to whether this film was racist or not, and I kept feeling somewhat off put by that. But I, I mean, it's not. I it, it just I think it's mostly because every character is a stereotype. Of I one think sort that you're another. just trying to make every movie racist. I think every movie comes off as like, especially from the old these older films, they come off as such, and it's like I didn't get that at all. <laughs> you didn't get that at all. What no. with the whole the fact that like every Italian in the movie is a gangster with a fucking white cat who eats nothing but pasta. <laughs> every you know the the uh, we have like every black stereotype represented. I don't here. know that that I thought that that was supposed to be like there for humor and observation to like so everything had its place. You're going to believe in a vampire exists in Brooklyn. You might as well believe that there's a mobster there too. <laughs> like like this yeah. is a whole like, like it's all a fantasy story. It's sure. all that's the meta context that believing that these stereotypes are as real as presented here is the same as believing that a vampire that there's something like a, a Dracula could exist or a ghoul right yeah okay let's assume that that's what it is it is actually a very strident anti-racist rant <laughs> let's run with that I'm, I'm good with that uh, then then I feel uh, less uh, uh, less terrible about laughing at some of the bits I did feel like the comedy inserted, especially with Eddie Murphy playing the different characters, just didn't fit in this film. And again, even if you take the whole racism argument out of it, you're dealing with the fact that I, I just don't think Wes Craven was deft at handling that. That's that's what I'm blaming it on, because I think he is... I, I, the scenes that really shine here are... I thought he did a great job directing the kind of love story scenes. For instance, you know, he commented on that one shot in the alleyway mm -hmm. with the steam rising and the shot closes in as they walk toward each other. It had a very Casablanca sort of feel to it, mm -hmm. I thought. All the seduction scenes are just gorgeously shot, very... It, it makes you feel intimate in it, with the characters and it, and it draws you style. in. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, and they... What the hell? And the horror, I thought, is is really well done, like the... Her transformation sequence is nicely done. Mm -hmm. The little cat scares here and there are well done, and the oh my god, the uh, the dead chick, the on hanging the, roommate. Yeah, that, that, that was that painted. was that was brilliantly conceived. Executed, yes. And, or yeah, executed. Uh, but the wacky comedy of I, I mean, it didn't fit Maximilian's character to suddenly turn into Carrot Top <laughs> for you know to be like I mean the idea of him pretending to be a preacher and trying to sway the con congregation into thinking that evil is good. Well, he was put on the spot. You know, he was he was dragged in there to the church without a without right. against his will and he had to bring everybody outside and he's like, "Well, you know, I I guess I can do this. I'm a badass vampire." Well, that's the thing though. He just he's so stupid. Like he he becomes the preacher because he wants to hear what Angela Bassett is going to say to the preacher because he knows that she's going to kind of unload 
her problems. And what does he do? He immediately starts walking toward the church as if he's going in there rather than being like, you know, let's maybe walk this way around the block mm -hmm. or something. And, and, and then he, and he keeps saying shit that's like off from what the preacher would be saying. Uh -huh. Like, oh, you feel like killing yourself. That's good. Yeah, it just basically repeats everything that she just said. And, and it, it, it just makes him seem like an idiot. And that's why I don't think it fit. Then as Guido, the guy who the holds Gary everyone... The looking guy. <laughs> sure. He's, he's just nothing but stupid shit. Yeah, he's a, a he's, yeah, and he, he's a caricature. With endless energy. Right, he's a caricature. He's all over the place. He's a cartoon character. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, yet Maximilian, we've seen through the entire thing, is, is reserved. I mean, I think the most uh, out of sorts he ever gets is when Angela Bassett runs away from him and he's, he's a woman. Yeah. I mean, that's that's about the most sort of emoting he does. But I think he gets the intel that he, what he had initially planned to get by, you know, impersonating those people. Right, but in, in the logic of the film, I think it would have made more sense if he went about it different ways rather than being like, hmm, what if this were an Eddie Murphy comedy? Which is what it was. Right. How would I play it? That That's essentially what Maximilian says before each of these scenes. And that doesn't seem to fit for his character. I thought it was interesting because we've watched a, a lot of movies with odd seduction techniques that we finally got to watch a movie that had pretty suave seduction yeah, techniques. Totally. I mean, this is, you know, it's all about a dance. The da I kept thinking the dance would be super impressive. It's really not that impressive, but it's romantic. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it would only take one dance and she'd be his. Yeah, and, and, and the, the lines that he uses on her. I mean, he cheats and gives her some of his blood so that she's more easily swayed, but still, he's charming and he's, he's suave. And, Even and with his creepy caramel-colored eyes. I, I think it was meant to be gold. <laughs> but okay, yeah. like a wolf's, right? Because he's a wolf at one point. Mm -hmm. He's kind of randomly a wolf at, like, two points in the movie. And I don't then... know, I just remember all those creepy eyeball scenes where you're looking over and the camera just takes a shot and he's like, his eyes are just like wide open and like, he's just like looking at her staring at her and she's just like hello you know <laughs> i think the best is when he's creeping down on the window oh it's yeah like, upside like, down yeah and, and he's like a creepy stalker spider man With like not neon yellow like eyeballs so angela bassett's love interest in this movie is justice detective justice mm -hmm. who starts off with this awesome hat this awesome oh, leather like yeah um, what's that called like a like a uh, like the type of hat that Andy Cap wears. And I call it like a driver hat, like those are tweed ones in Ireland, but it's right. like the leather version for Brooklyn. Yeah, and 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 that, and he takes it off very quickly in the movie, and that was a poor choice on everybody's part because that hat was awesome. Angela Bassett gets a cool hat at one point. But um, yeah, all his credibility was in his hat. <laughs> it's true. I really, I was like, I buy that he is a detective because mm -hmm. of this hat. His character is just very generic. Likeable guy, right? Yeah. Who happens to know like kung fu? Yeah, that was that kind of came out of nowhere. But I guess you're fighting a vampire. Suddenly, like this kind of uh, I think that's human you could use it, yeah. human memory of kung fu, like this this uh, collective unconscious uh, vampire fighting skills comes out. Perhaps mm -hmm. the uh, like he was a slayer deep down. Maybe mm -hmm. he also was suffering from uh, fedora wearing friend syndrome, just like. If I stand near her and be a good buddy enough, one day she'll notice that I care about her. Uh -huh. Which kind of, like, it sounds kind of annoying and horrible, but it kind of works in, because they work together. So yeah. it, because of that, it would be awkward. He doesn't really have a choice. You know, if it, if, it was, if it was just that they knew each other, you'd be like, come on, douche, grow a pair and, like, stop fucking Suck it up. resenting her for this, right? And blaming her for the gaming industry <laughs> problems. But it's like, okay, it would be sexual harassment. <laughs> so, ow. So, it, it all it all works out. And he, uh, yeah, he, he learns Kung Fu and tries to save Angela Bassett from becoming a vampire. And so that's nice of him. Yeah, and right before he almost does her roommate. Right. The roommate, that's the... So, in every horror movie, you have to have the sexy girl who likes sex. Yes. And she has to die. For some reason. Someone's gotta die. <laughs> it's she's punished for you know Being what this too sexy. Yeah. Right. She's too sexy for the movie. You know what in this movie, that girl should have been white. She should have been the helpful white roommate rather than the helpful black roommate in most <laughs> horror movies, right? Uh, Switch up the, the role a little. I think that would change the all black cast. 
Well, I mean, it wasn't a hundred percent black cast. Those those Italians weren't just the other actors, those are like in white face. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but the the sexy roommate who likes sex tries to have sex with Detective Justice, and he's not having it. Yeah, he's like ten feet away from his his love interest. <laughs> also, he has a love interest, and it's like, yo, I can never say anything to her. But two words for you, hot roommate: cold shower. That's that's exactly right. But then she gets beast fucked. Yeah, by, by Eddie Murphy. Yeah. Which I don't know is beast fucking a thing. I don't know. It? You kept saying it while we were watching the movie. It must be real. <laughs> if you believe well, it's real, well, because it they must said be it real. in the film. It's not. Oh no! I thought you made it up. No, the character, the 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 uh, Jules's uncle or whatever. Oh, yeah. yeah, he was like, she'd be beast fucking all That's night. Right. Bang 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 bang. He was probably one bang. of my favorites in the movie. <laughs> Right, so there's that guy. He he and Julius are all they're like this wacky comedy duo. duo. Julius mm-hmm. is Kadeem Hardison from a different world, a great actor. In this movie, he is the Ren Renfield Renfro Renfield Renfield, not Renfro Brad Renfro. That's that's a different thing. Uh, yeah, he's the Renfield character. He's eating bugs and losing ears and shit. And he's often with his uncle, who's drunk. Yeah, and a great character actor and the landlord of of the building that uh, the vampire is renting from. He seems to kind of, anytime they need, like, something for the plot, it's like, he's that. Mm -hmm. Like, he's the night watchman where the boat comes in at the beginning, and then he happens to be a landlord, and then he happens to have specific plot information for Detective Justice when he needs it. He's just, it's kind of like, we don't know how to patch the script here, let's throw what's-his-name into this scene and just have him go. Because he never really seemed to be operating from a script. (laughs) He didn't really have any alliances either. No. Till the very end. Till the, right, till the very end when the vampires try to kill him. Then he's, he's less on their side. There was also, uh, speaking of kind of the uh, side characters, there is the, I, I don't know what the hell he was, the nightclub owner, Dr. Zako or whatever. Oh yeah, the, the one who does magic. Yeah, and had... Had been in the Bermuda Triangle. Right, which is... known Angela Bassett's mother. Yeah, in the Bermuda Triangle, which is where uh, Eddie Murphy's character is from. The thing that upset me about his character is he gives them the magic exposition book that you need in a horror movie, and nobody opens the goddamn thing. Literally, when the characters need the information later, they just go to him. Yeah. And he's like, oh, okay, yeah, I got a giant fucking staff. I'll yeah, come help like, you out. I have this book, but I loaned it to somebody. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> nobody cracks that book. I really wonder if there's a, a deleted scene with them reading the book, or else if it's just like... Uh, you know, it, it just, we had to put a giant, burnt-looking, evil book in here, and we did a job done. That's it. Kadeem Hardison as the Renfield character, my problem with him is, again, he's playing wacky comedy, and I think it works for him simply because I think having one character be the comic relief, or even two characters with his uncle or whatever, mm-hmm. I think that's okay. It's just when Eddie Murphy starts doing the comedy relief. Yeah. Uh, that that it, it doesn't, it feels like it's in the wrong movie. But when they're doing it, it's like, well, they're wacky sidekick characters, mm-hmm. so this is okay. And the thing is, you know, Jules the Ghoul doesn't really become that, that humorous until after he starts to deteriorate. He had just been playing off of his uncle. He was still pretty wacky in the opening, though. I mean, the whole, oh yeah, that bitch be wanting me back, right? Yeah, that, yeah, she be begging for it come tomorrow. Don't throw my Adidas at me! I mean, all that shit, like, just over and over and over asleep. again. During, right. <laughs> during the action. He was... Uh, snoring. He was he was beast fucking her sloth style. <laughs> Which, I mean, I've heard tales about. Makeup on him was really good. Awesome. He looked like a burn victim at a certain point. He also kind of looked like a ghoul from Fallout 3. Which I thought was fun. He almost single-handedly pushed this into the R rating because it was rated R for vampire violence, which I love that, (laughs) and language. But yeah, so he used a lot of language, but then there was vampire violence. Mm -hmm. The last character we have is the Angela Bassett character. So she's essentially the Mina character in here. Mm -hmm. She is drawn into becoming a vampire. She drinks his blood. She becomes seduced by the night. Then she begins fighting it. Yes. Especially with the help of Detective Justice. Yes, so yeah, she's, she's, she starts to love Detective Justice, and then suddenly Vampire in Brooklyn shows up and is like, hey babe, let me save you from this car rushing by. And she's like, oh, I forgot about you. Oh, you're very handsome. Yes, I will go to dinner with you. And there's a Justice, the partner, showing up, trying to invite her out to pizza when she was going to go have some facility pasta over at the Vampire's place. I thought it was kind of cute. Detective Justice. Bola Justice. Here's the thing that I want to bring up, talk about, see, get your thoughts on this. 
In many ways, this movie, especially the third act, when she has been bitten and tasted the blood and, and started to vamp out, it becomes kind of the anti-Twilight. And how so? The last Twilight movies, Breaking Dawn, the, the last book, the lead character finally becomes a vampire. Kirsten Stewart, Bella, finally ah. becomes a vampire. You know, the whole story has been leading to this so that their love can last forever. Is that werewolf still in love with her baby? Yeah. He's, he's totally not going to fuck her until she's like seven, though, so it's cool. Yeah. Totally cool. It's imprinting, Audrey. It's romantic. You keep saying that. <laughs> but I'm still alive! <laughs> Haven't convinced you yet, huh? <laughs> it's the second time that it's, it's come so up romantic. The idea that you're seven. <laughs> I found this interesting because I, myself, I, I guess I fall more in the Twilight camp because I was like, fuck, dude. Eat the bitch. Like, become a vampire. Embrace it, because this is... I mean, okay, Eddie Murphy's kind of a dick, but once you turn over, you can just leave him, because if you're going to have vampire power, he live forever, right? Well, she didn't read that book is the problem. <laughs> I don't know that she knows that. <laughs> right, the book would be... The book would have told her. It would be like, you the, will be immortal. You will be the biggest bit, badass ever that lived and walked the earth. Yeah, um, and, and maybe once she sees Kadeem Hardison strutting around as a vampire at the end, she'll be like, shit, I really... I, I missed, because uh, he gets all pimped out at the end, and yeah. gets his arm back, and mm -hmm. very happy, and his eyes. And that fully equipped downstairs. Oh, that's right, that's right. He gets gigantic... Balls. Because <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's all... Toenail uh, hair. <laughs> the... <laughs> the <laughs> Should have went there first. <laughs> the... <laughs> What, what did you think about that? Did you feel like the romance between Justice and her was strong enough to warrant that ending, or uh, did you feel like it it, it, it was a, like, I, I don't want to say cop-out, but a, a weaker ending? I want to say I thought it was weak, simply because they really haven't had their kissing yet. There was that moment where she kind of was being taken over and vamping out, and starts to rip off his shirt and, like, force herself on him, but he wasn't really having it yet, and then she storms out. Doesn't flip out, flails around, runs downstairs. She um, flails a lot. She flails a lot. Um, so, no, I think they needed to have one solid romantic kiss. I think more confirming than... Confirming that they had similar affections, other than just a couple words here and there. More than that, I felt that since the entire thrust of Act 2 is Eddie Murphy wooing her, I mean, that is, like, literally... The plot of this movie. Eddie mm -hmm. Murphy has to get into Angela Bassett's pants, or mm -hmm. neck at least. Yeah. Into her decolletage. And but she has to come willingly. She so come willingly. It's, him, it's him playing the pickup artist. Yeah. That would have been fucking awesome if he would have played a pickup artist who we went to see <laughs> to get uh, notes on this, you know? Like, neg her. You got to neg her. But, <laughs> oh, God, I'm saying that. That sounds horrible. But, it does. <laughs> um, but, it, <laughs> but it's, you know, if negging was brought up and things like that, if it was like... Tell her her blouse looks bad, and then kiss her. <laughs> oh, yeah, because there was a strategy. You had to break her down, kill her roommate. Um, <laughs> I know that. Use her fears against her to lure her in, and then flatter her with all the things she already loves. Use a big intel search. Yeah. He went right for kill the roommate, which yeah. is usually at least step well, no, four for me. Bang the roommate. <laughs> right, first beast fuck the room. <laughs> which, oh, right, because he was trying to put the... the blame on Justice, which I thought it was odd because when she accuses Justice, he says, I didn't fuck her like twice, and then after that he's like, we like, see things different. Yeah, yeah, it's like, it's a little complicated. You're like, what? <laughs> and it's like, so, Wait for vampire. <laughs> it's like, so, m the way that I took that was that he had fucked her in the past, and that's why he was pushing her away so hard, because he's like, I can't go down that road again. And by road, I mean your vagina. I think she was just a cat and he... She, I, that could, well, I, I agree, and I think he got cat scratch fever sometime in the past. Perhaps. <laughs> Speaking of cat scratch fever, which is a song, let's talk about the goddamn music in this movie. It was awesome. Oh my god. It was awesome if you like the musical equivalent of getting punched in the face repeatedly. My, my favorite thing about the music is that when they were playing the music, whoever was talking, you couldn't hear over the music. Like, you had to get really, really close. And it was always when something important was happening. Right, like the whole <laughs> explanation about the Bahamas and how her mother relates to this plot and what it means, that's all very superstitious, like a reggae funk cover of Superstitious is playing over that entire thing. And there's this... 
bald preacher dude who's trying to explain, like, in the Bahamas, very superstitious. And it just, it doesn't. What was the song that they finally danced to? Was it, like, Woman Don't Cry or something like that? <laughs> I don't even, I don't even remember. Oh, it was, that's funny. Yeah, it, it was not. <laughs> it was not a sexy song. It was more like, you poor little baby girl, come dance in my arms and I will take all of the pain away. Was it? I didn't even, I didn't even. But it was still supposed to be sexy. Like, I just remember it being a little too uh, Caribbean Queen. It, it was kind of like... It looked like Caribbean Queen, but it was not Caribbean Queen. It wasn't quite as like uh, poppy was... as Caribbean Queen, but it had that kind of undertone of... You might hear this we on a cruise ship. You find out what that was. You could hear this on a cruise ship. I don't think it matters. It wasn't <laughs> It wasn't the best song choice it could have been. But we did hear Shoop. Did we? Oh, no, What a Man? What right, we What a Man. What a man. What a man. Right. Oh, that's yeah. right. That's right. What a Man for like... What was that, the ghoul driving up? or I mean, it was something, like, really inappropriate for What a Man. It, it was some sort of... I guess it was just, like, the introduction to the hood. Yeah. I want to believe they lived at 227. Do you remember? That, is that a club? Do you remember 227? No, it was a sitcom. What are you... <laughs> what's going on? I'm just, like, I'm trying to figure out what that is. <laughs> are you, I'm trying to remember Justice's line in the movie. Are you sure you want to do that? Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm not going to stop. <laughs> I'm circling around because it's been a very long day, but the point that I, the reason I asked you about it was because, yeah, I definitely felt the Justice romance. I, I mean, I felt kind of bad for Justice, but I'm like, eh, shit happens. Well, he's just like hanging around waiting for that vampire to leave so then he can swoop in. I mean, I kind of believe that he still his, wouldn't swoop in. What's his in. choice? Right. It's like he should move on and find someone who he doesn't work with. That is actually interested enough to pursue a relationship with. Yeah, exactly. I, I, He's getting to be that age. Yeah. <laughs> His mother's worried. It just been staring at the bright light for so long. To me, it seemed like, okay, you know, let's assume Eddie Murphy is, or Maximilian is dead, and that whatever the hell happened with Kadeem Hardison isn't going to affect them. Now they go back to their jobs as police officers, and they're just against a wall, basically. Whereas, she could have had the world. Yeah, I mean, it'd be hard to decide what you'd want to do. I, she might just be dead now. We don't really see... Actually, she is alive and well. Is she? Angela Bassett? Yeah. Not she Angela was in, Bassett. She was in... <laughs> Whatever the hell her name... Rita America. Vita, that's her name. Rita Vita. We, but for all we know, the sun comes up and kills Rita Vita. No, she goes back to normal because the head vampire was killed. But we don't we don't know that, right? Because, yeah, we do know it because Eddie Murphy had plucked her pendant, which was a cross. Oh, that's right. She touches the neck, cross. She picks up the cross and, and looks at it and puts it right next to her, which she would have normally had a reaction to. Right, that's right. She, did, so she was able to touch the cross. She turned back. That. That's not, that's not the epilogue. The epilogue doesn't stay on the romance angle, which was the crux of the climax of the movie. Instead, the epilogue is like seven minutes with Kadeem Hardison talking about a schlong. And being awesome. And, yeah, which brings me to what I would change. Okay, yeah, let's go ahead and... I think we have hit on everything here. Oh, just a couple of other sure, really, sure. really quick things. An example of the comedy falling flat. Eddie Murphy has a line, I am not interested in your hose. Uh, and it's like, really, was that supposed to be funny? There's all this, like, horrible exposition that's shoved in there. And my favorite was when it was shoved in by the lieutenant, who fucking loves Xanax. The cop lieutenant is, like, this woman who reads her lines as if she's late to pick up her kids from school. Are you talking about the red-haired lady? Yeah. Who's the, right on top of it, Rose. The Rose from Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead, the boss that uh, Christina Applegate goes to work for. When the grandmother dies. Was that the lieutenant or the chick who he ghouls? The lieutenant. Was it? Okay, or, yeah. She, you know, chief, captain, whatever. Because she delivers her lines in a way that it, it's like, I can't believe she's not over her mother's death yet. Hey, we caught another. There's a couple more. She has a, a very, as a matter of fact, voice. Very sleepy voice, I think. Very, very sleepy sleepy voice. Oh, I love that the bad guys with Kadeem Hardison in the beginning soil his hat to show how mean they are. Oh, they're yeah. chasing him down. Like they're wiping off blood from their shoe <laughs> with his dirty hat. No, they, they, just, they just rub his hat into a puddle and it's like, oh yeah, take that. And it's like, it's just a He's fucking like, check hat. check this out. <laughs> I'm gonna fuck with this guy. <laughs> I thought it was really odd that nobody noticed that he was just falling apart or seemed to care. Like his, his comedy sidekick duo was like, Man, you better get that hand looked at, you know, because mm -hmm. it falls off while he's waxing the car or whatever. Yeah. And and then the uh, detective justice sees it at one point and is just like, hey, do you know anything about... And it's like, what about the fact that he looks like a fucking Yeah, uh, I mean, get in a cab cool. and take yourself to the doctor. Somebody should have said that. Somebody should have said that. Nobody does. 
Oh, I wanted to point out that I really think that Patrick Lussier, uh, I believe that's how you pronounce his name, is a fucking god, and he proves it with this film. Patrick Lussier was the editor. He was Wes Craven's editor on a lot of things up to Scream, and then after that he became a director in his own right. Mm -hmm. And I thought the editing on this was especially, like, it really saved some scenes that could have been much worse. Could have been had we known what they were. What do you mean by that? <laughs> what about the editing? Like, for instance, when the ship is coming in at the uh -huh, beginning, uh -huh. the way that, like, because it's this ridiculously unbelievable conceit that two people are sitting in a room and a giant fucking yacht is Comes destroying the pier that's like behind them. Bitty. Right behind them. And they don't hear it because they're watching Family Feud and they're really into it. And we can't hear it because there's music playing in the background where we should be able to hear. Though I heard most of it and you weren't missing much. Say sheets! Say sheets! I like you! That's pretty much all that was there. <laughs> But it's such a ridiculous concept, yet I thought the editing pulled it off really well, and when it hit, it was timed really well, and it, I felt like, oh shit, like I, you know, Kadeem Hardison jumps, and it's like, I, I felt like that really captured that sort of thing. And then, for instance, the, the dancing and the way that that edits and then mm -hmm. pushes to the moon. And... Yeah, no, yeah, it reminded me a lot of Batman. Like, um, the music did in the beginning, the, the editing, the quick editing there, and just kind of the, the drama of I the could, beginning. I could definitely yeah. see that. Yeah. The white cat gets shot. There, there's a lot of animal violence in this movie. <laughs> Dr. Evil's cat gets shot, and then he's holding its hind legs in his hand, still petting it at the end of the scene. <laughs> so that brings us to the end. Uh, if you could change, or what one thing would you change that you think could make this a much better film? They could have released a sequel with Jewel the Ghoul immediately after. <laughs> or or maybe like a spin-off, like the Pootie Tang movie. <laughs> sure. <laughs> like a much lower budget and uh, a lot more character I just, you know, actors. I just like his uncle so much, so him driving the limousine around with him in the back as a vampire with a red ring, that makes you a vampire when you're a ghoul falling apart. There you go. Yeah, it's just like... I, I think... I, want, I needed a little more explanation, I think, with that. Definitely. Or a little less. I think that would have been what I would change, is cut out all the comedy. I would make it just a... Um, uh, a black recasting of Dracula and do it straight and do it much creepier. And what's the significance of the red ring? They never explain it. Was that also in the book that they never read? Probably. It must have been. It was like, and when you kill Maximilian or when you kill the last vampire, make sure to get that red ring because yeah. if you don't destroy it. Is that what you meant by good editing? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to parse through what you meant there. No, but again... The editing, <laughs> Sorry. the editing, the editing does save the fact that you realize, oh, the ring is significant. I don't know why. Because they edited that out. Possibly. That was good. I guess. <laughs> well, that was. I'm I don't... just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but it's. But again, you you see what happens to the ring, and and following its trail mm -hmm. makes sense. Even okay. though, I mean, Patrick can't help the fact that the script was lacking. But yeah, definitely that end scene needs some explanation. Instead, it was just like. Tight. How do we end this on a wacky Eddie Murphy movie note? And it was like, just like Kadeem Hardison, that other dude, just roll with it yeah. for like 15 minutes. And I don't know. I Honestly, I think that would have been stupid. I think I think my, my suggestion is stupid. I don't know what... What was your suggestion? To do it straight. To do it as a horror movie. Oh, pfft. not with Eddie Murphy. Then it wouldn't even be Vampire in Brooklyn. It wouldn't even be an Eddie Murphy movie if it wasn't well, funny. I, yeah, but I don't think it was funny. I thought it was uh, for its time. <laughs> I mean, I think all the people involved in it are very funny. But, you know, Angela Bassett was just so serious. She's always so serious. Yeah, she was playing Except the... Except when she was flailing around. She was, uh, she was the... Oh, I can't remember her name, but Sigourney Weaver said about Ghostbusters that she's the blah, blah, blah to the Marx Brothers. And there was that one woman who was in very many Marx Brothers movies, and her entire point to be in the movie was it's kind to of... Be, yeah, yeah, well, is to be the straight man yeah. to everything that's going on around her. And uh, that's very much Angela Bassett. Mm -hmm. Angela Bassett and Justice are the, uh, the straight men yep. in this movie. Gotcha. So I don't know. What would, what would I change? I would... I think well, I would... be <laughs> Okay, but I, you could say that about... Anything. More ass. Because ass is good. No, I think I would have made it a different actor other than Eddie Murphy. I don't think he did a bad job, but I think it's like contractually in there that he has to play multiple characters, and that is mostly what ruined it. I want to say that Eddie Murphy wanted to make a vampire movie, and this is what was made. Very possible. Because I, I, when I see it, I see Eddie Murphy wants to do something creative and wants to do a vampire movie, because everybody eventually does, right? Probably okay. no, and that's that's very possible, and it could it could be very much like Michael Jackson with Thriller. Michael Jackson was like, I want to make 
a short horror film, and so I'm going to go get John Landis because I fucking loved American Werewolf in London, and this could have been Eddie Murphy being like, I want to do a vampire movie, and to make sure that we get the horror right, I'm going to pull in Wes Craven because, I don't know, maybe he loved Last House on the Left, I have no idea. <laughs> So that could be. All right. Well, we have solved that. We made it better. Yeah. Did we? I don't know. Mm-hmm. I can't even remember. Did I answer it? I, I still don't. don't I don't fucking know. More wine. <laughs> That's think, wine with an H. No. There should not. There should you be can any. have the one with the H. I'm going to have the one with a W. I. <laughs> with <E>. sans H. <laughs> yeah. We, um, less shouty. Less shouty Angela Bassett. That would have worked for me, I think. But instead. Less shirty. Angela Bassett would work for me. That works for me too. All right, I'm I'm there. Okay, I think we've uh, we've just about reached a point of inebriation that we need to end this thing. So for now, this is Michael T. Bradley and Audrey Ivancy. And I want to remind everybody: if you have feedback, if you watch this movie, if you think we missed something big, if you want to add to the conversation, feel free to write to info at iceonmars.net. Goodbye. Bye. You have been listening to Ice on Mars.